Yeah, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for coming to this conversation. My name is Rafael Ortega. I'm the Associate Dean for Diversity and Multicultural Affairs in the School of Medicine. And I'm here with my colleague, Dr. David Henderson, who's an Assistant Dean in our office and Professor and Chair of the Department of Psychiatry. Uh, together, we will moderate this conversation. Let me begin by stating the mission and vision of the Office of Diversity here in the medical school. It is to lead medical schools in diversity by developing programs that educate, recruit, and retain a multicultural constituency. We foster an environment that demonstrates our belief that diversity adds to intellectual development, academic discourse, patient care, and research. It is from this perspective that we are creating this space to have what I anticipate will be a difficult but necessary conversation about race and violence. And we feel that it is our responsibility to demonstrate to everyone, especially to our young trainees, that we care. And this is not the first time that we gather to address issues of violence and inequities. Just a couple of weeks ago, we organized a memorial for the Orlando shooting victims. At the time, we were at such a loss for words that the only thing we could come up was with a moment of silence, followed by a couple of notes on the piano with a classical piece. On that occasion, someone wrote to me expressing frustration with observing yet one more moment of silence, stating that action is required and that there should be no more silence for the dead. The last two MLK Martin Luther King celebrations have focused on issues of violence, including the Ferguson shooting two years ago, so eloquently addressed by Kermit Crawford, who's here today. And this year, Dr. Winston Langley, who's the provost of the University of Massachusetts, Boston, spoke about the urgent need for brotherhood and understanding. You may also recall the powerful panel discussion we had after the San Bernardino shootings with the participation of several of our Muslim colleagues. You can see videos and hear recordings of these and other events in our website, which is increasingly being populated by themes addressing violence and intolerance. This brings us to today. We are a large urban medical campus and hospital, and we work with and train individuals from very diverse backgrounds we provide care for the most heterogeneous patient population in the city. Surely, many are greatly concerned with the climate of violence in our country, and we wonder how our institutions can react, or should react. This meeting is an attempt to provide a space in which everyone has the opportunity to voice their feelings and to suggest how we can contribute as individuals and as institutions to justice, peace, and understanding. In the interest of maintaining a balanced discussion, we extended an invitation to the Boston Police Department. I want you to know, however, their hands are really full, and they express their regret for not being able to attend. I should also mention that this program is being recorded, because if we don't record it, somebody else will. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, the invitation uh, to this conversation states that Dr. Henderson and I will be moderating a panel discussion. And you may be wondering, who is the panel? Uh, the panel is you. Um, thank you so much for being here, David. Thank you, I'm sorry to have to be here. I wish we were in, in 2016 not dealing with what we have to deal with. Um, but we're here, and I, I see this as an opportunity for us to come together as a community to help our communities and to come up with solutions that that will help this country and our communities kind of move forward. We have to solve this problem, um, and it's it's not going away. It can dampen down. The media exposure will die down, and then it'll happen again. And so, so this is clearly now is the time to for these issues that keep coming up, that impact lives, particularly young lives and um, young African-American lives, we have to uh, come together and, and come up with some solutions. And I, you know, I can't tell you, like in this past month, you know, get my son coming downstairs with his phone saying, Dad, it happened again. Here it is. And the last time they, well, this time, you know, the guy was following the instructions you gave me, and he's dead. So what do we do with that? Like, how do we figure this out? How do we prevent young people and old 
from being killed unnecessarily? And then how do we prevent Orlando from happening again? It's, it's bad no matter how you slice it, no matter whatever side, when people die like this, it's bad. And so we look to you now. We have a lot of bright people in this room. We have a lot of kind and caring and compassionate people in this room. We have a lot of young people. We have a lot of not so young people <laughs> in, in, in this room. So, let's, yeah, I'm not naming names, <laughs> but let's begin the dialogue and let's start as the medical community take a stand. Let's come up with ideas. Let's figure out what do we have to do to prevent this? How do we change brains? How do we get people to, and for instance, police officers, to not have their biases explode in their brain so fast that they have to pull a gun and shoot? Right? How do we get people not responding to that by gathering up all the weapons they can and start picking people up? What can we do to prevent that? From the medical community, I think we have a role to play. And so I think I'm going to stop and we're going to open it up. And so if you would like to speak, make a comment, um, raise your hand, we'll bring the mic to you. And then this is a dialogue. Um, I have no answers, but we do need answers and we need to come together to find them. Okay? You know, thank you, David. Who wants to go first? I should recognize that uh, Dean Elmore from the Charles River campus is here today. Thank you for coming, Ken. Uh, and of course, I see uh, the president of Boston Medical Center. Kate, hey, please say hello. I see so many other people that are leaders in our institution. Forgive me if I don't mention it, it will take too long. But I really appreciate you being here because only together we can take this conversation forward. So the microphones are open for you folks. Just raise your hand. My name is Priya Joshi and I'm an internal medicine physician in uh, general internal medicine here at the hospital. And um, this is a very emotional topic, so I'll try not to, uh, to have my voice shake too much. But um, I've had a number of patients report to me over the past few years their experiences um, with police brutality and I'm not sure how to respond and while I don't have any input or feedback or solutions for that, it's something that I wanted to share with you and hopefully someone else has experienced this themselves as a physician or a uh, practitioner, clinician. Um, and maybe we can talk about that. But uh, in response to your question about what can we do in the medical community, um, working very closely with our police officers here in Boston, um, I feel like it's our responsibility to reach out to them, whether they are patients of ours directly or uh, in an effort to advance a public health um, program to reach out to them. I know that we have systems in place for clinicians who suffer um, from anxiety, um, whether it's from public speaking or something along those lines, for us to utilize here at the hospital. If we can possibly um, extend these services to the police officers in an effort to work with them side by side, um, clearly they recognize that this is an issue that they must address. Um, in my opinion, very slowly. Um, and while we, in medical speak, we often uh, call patients who are not ready to address a problem, um, we deem them as pre-contemplative, that they're not ready to move forward yet. Um, perhaps that's where some of the police officers in the city of Boston are, um, and hopefully they're moving towards working uh, with professionals in order to um, uh, to improve this issue, um, to alleviate this issue completely. But I think that a lot of clinicians, internists, psychiatrists, psychologists here at the hospital 
Um, and certainly at the main campus in the Danielson Institute, we have services in place that ideally we can extend and broaden um, and work with them to, it's my dream to completely reprogram them and recondition them so that they do not associate black or brown or not white with dangerous. Um, and threatening. Thank you so much. Despite Thank that you. being naive, I think that that, that is an ultimate goal. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. I should, uh, I should recognize perhaps the most important segment of the attendees here today, which are the early medical school selection program students. These are rising juniors and rising seniors from historically black colleges and Hispanic serving institutions. It, it is them that I am concerned the most. So I, I really want to uh, impress upon you that we should keep them in our minds as we make any statements over here. So thank you for coming, guys. Samantha, and, and please keep your comments uh, short to the point so that we can give everyone an opportunity. So I think one of the things that strikes me is I feel as though there's these three pillars. One is my own personal reaction, which I think all of us are struggling with. The second is this: the concept of violence and fixing the problem that leads to the violence, perhaps re-educating police officers, um, helping them deal with their stress. But then I feel very concerned because I don't know, as a medical community, where we fit into that. I think all of us underestimate our power as advocates and as community workers to be able to reach into places where bias is being bred and engendered um, in youth and people who have leadership opportunities in teachers um, and community leaders and to try and reorient their thinking because I think that's where it starts. I think the moment that the police officer is standing at the door of the car is not the moment where it starts. I think it starts way before then. And we see it in many other outcomes. That's, as a physician, that's a symptom, right? <laughs> what are the other symptoms? Poor education, poor housing, poor food, poor access to almost every resource we have in the United States for anyone who's marginalized for whatever reason. And I think that's where we have the opportunity to be impactful. Thank you. That was Samantha Kaplan, the director of the program that I just mentioned, and an assistant dean in our office. Please introduce yourself and take the microphone. Who's next? Hermit, say something. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think I need a microphone. No, no, the, 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 I'm from North Carolina, so <laughs> I'm used to yelling across fields. I'm, I'm Hermit Crawford. I'm director of the uh, Center for Multicultural uh, Mental Health. Center for Multicultural Training and Psychology, and I'm also a director of the uh, executive director of the Massachusetts Marathon Bombing Victims Resiliency Center. I said all that because I find myself, as um, uh, has been said before, I mean, I'm a black male and I have two black male sons. So this is particularly important for me. My fear is not to be able to do anything because I don't know what to do, but I don't want to in any way engender hopelessness or helplessness. And I also don't want to give in to anger because that would lead me to bitterness. But I know in this instance something has to be done. So as I try to figure it out, I'm leaving here and I'm going over to the Unity Rally at police headquarters. I would invite any of the rest of you who are able to come to join me. But I wanted to say as I try to understand what's going on, I want to ask myself, what is the what? And we can talk about Alton Sterling. We can talk about Fernando uh, Castillo. But if you look at The Guardian, U.S., uh, you'll see that in the year 2015, that 1,134 black males between the ages of 14 and 34 were lost their lives at the hands of police. 1,134 across the nation. They break it down by state. How they get the data is through Facebook, through Twitter, and they independently verify and they also get it through file and freedom of information. So I feel like this is what a number of people have said, that this is an epidemic. An epidemic is uh, a disease that affects a number of people in a particular community. And if you say it's not a disease, the uh, environmental factors are a part of the disease nomenclature. So I, fig I feel that while I figure out myself what to do, then I have to do something. I just can't sit still. I can't sit on a throne of privilege that I've had so much in my adult life as Dr. Crawford because this really does boil down to the common denominator for me of Kermit. So while I'm figuring out what I have to do, I'll be standing, I'll be marching, I'll be speaking, 
I'll be working with others to be able to come up with a permanent solution so that my children and their children's children don't have to deal with the same set of circumstances that we should have put to rest a long time ago. Thank you, Dr. Arthur. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Jason, sorry to put you on the spot. Jason Hall is the only black surgeon we have in our operating rooms, and he's been up all night, but he has an interesting story to tell. Wake up, man. <laughs> <laughs> So it's a bot night offering, but um, I'm Jason Hall, one of the co-rectal surgeons uh, here at BMC. Um, and I, it's funny, uh, over 20 years ago now, I've been held at gunpoint by police twice. And so whenever, gun to the head on the floor for walking down the street. And every time I see one of these incidents, it brings back a sense of rage and anger that I physically have to subdue and then sort of move on to more positive um, thoughts about how we're gonna address this kind of problem. And I have to leave soon, but I think um, one of the only things that we can do when it comes to these kind of things is to shine light on the problem. And by shining light, I mean we have to think about, as physicians, lobbying for national standards um, for reporting. Because right now we know 1,100 people died, but we have to get that data from Facebook. And so one thing I've always thought is every state should have reporting on how many blacks they stop for traffic stops, what are the outcomes, how many of those people are shot, because it's only by shining the light on the problem that we'll understand it. Thank you so much, Jason. Dyson. Um, I, What's your rank and serial number? Oh, <laughs> I'm also the registrar at the School of Medicine. Ah, uh, excellent. Um, I guess one thing, one comment that I want to make is that I, I'm not surprised at the lack of, and I'll call it respect for black males, because I saw when we elected a black president a downward spiral in the way blacks are treated. That was the tip of an iceberg, and people made comments at the time that we were post-racial, but that actually scratched a soul that opened up in this country. Because people, there were a lot of people angry. And if you look, this gets me angry, <laughs> if you look at the disrespect that was given to this president, where some people couldn't even say President Obama, Barack Obama, Mr. Obama. It's disrespectful. And this president was treated like dirt from his first State of the Union address. And that's a part of the, that's a symptom of what is happening in this country. And my dream is that when he leaves office on the last day, he acknowledges that that's what happened here. Because things have gotten worse, not better. And so I feel it's a reaction to his presidency. So what are we going to do about that? Elect Donald Trump? Mm -hmm. I mean, no. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, that's, that's my point. So, what, so we have a person, Hillary or Donald Trump, and we have a decision to make. Some people hate Hillary Clinton. I'm sorry, she's a better choice than Donald Trump. He is going to do nothing, and this is not a, I'm not trying to get political, but I what? mean, we, we're, at a, we're at a point where who we choose for president is gonna determine how we deal with racial issues in this country. Are we gonna pick someone who's gonna feed into them, or are we gonna pick someone who's gonna at least try to have some sort of idea about where we need to go in a positive direction. True, but the, the, uh, there are conflicts within both parties that I am having trouble reconciling. And, and I do agree that we should not get too political in this forum. Because my, as I stated in the beginning, we are a medical school and a medical center, and we have patients to care for and trainees and students to nurture. And is, it is uh, with that in mind that we have created that space and anybody that deviates a little bit from, from that goal, 
uh, uh, is not really abiding by our request to, to, to provide suggestions and commentaries that help us be as good as we can be. I mean, I, I, Jason, I tell you, man, I was, really, I was really happy to see you walking down the hallway in, in the operating room as, as, as sort of the replacement for, for Kofi Adamses who left to take care of his parents in Florida because you, we need role models big time, left and right, and you're one of them. Thank you so much. And by the way, he's half Latino. We have role models. We need more. We need and we're doing our best here in this medical school by bringing as many people as we can from a diverse background. Next. So many microphones. Ken, please. So glad you're here, man. Uh, Ken Edmore, the Dean of Students at, the Univers at Boston University. And um, the, the rule, the rule, last week it showed me that there are no rules anymore. There are no rules. So I got to go back to being political. Because in essence, what happened throughout the week was a wholesale show that the way that we were told to act, the way we were told to behave, was out the window. Whether it be a police officer protecting people, or whether it be someone who's just doing the basic things, the decent thing that I'm supposed to be able to do. The rules have changed to the point where even if I'm not doing anything wrong, I may not be able to get a trial because I'll be dead before I do it. The rules have changed where even if I'm doing something wrong, I may be dead and I can't get a trial for it. The rules may have changed where even if I got an attitude or I think that I want to be uppity, I can't do that anymore. And I've gone through too much of my life. So, you know, as Kermit said, sitting in the throne of privilege that I am, I'm going to change the rules a little bit. It is about politics. It's got to be about politics. And, and Dr. Otega, you said what so many of us think. We have the plurality. Those of us who are saying that we are not committed to a Republican or a Democrat, to a Clinton or a Trump, we have the plurality right now is what I hear. Well, you know what we need to do? Let us find a way outside of, fine, outside of the institution, the university. I'm going to be the first to say my views do not represent Boston University. <laughs> I'm here, I'm here as a citizen, I'm here as a citizen, and I just say, let me deviate just for a quick minute, and let me say this, we need to all get together, the, the plurality needs to get together, and we need to say, let's all put a dollar in, because politicians like that money, and let's find a way that we disrupt, the system's disrupted already, so I'd be okay with us having a real problem with who the president is come November. We've gone through that before. And by the way, I keep up with Lorac in for a little longer, too. <laughs> but, but we need to find a way that, from an electoral standpoint, we can disrupt this system a little bit. So why doesn't the plurality get together and figure out a way to do that? What's more, I want to remind us, too, as a citizen, the police are under my controls. The police, my background is law, so the police are under civilian control. We should think about ways that we train police right, more effectively, how we transition many back that transform police forces into being police officers so that they know that they're not in Fallujah anymore. How we decide, we decide whether or not they use force or not. We decide that. We can authorize the use of deadly force or not as citizens. So I think we have to politically do that. We are the role models, yes, and we are the people who they listen to. So why not use the political system, intersect with the political system? Why not say yes, doctors, professionals, deans, and all of us, I'm stepping up, stepping up. I'm not representing my university, but as a professional, I'm here. I know how the game is played, and let's play it. Thank you, again. My name is Flavio uh, Santiago. I'm a patient navigator uh, here at UC. And, um, we are calling everybody to the table here, but we need to call the politicians to the table and tell them that if you want my vote, you need to make some changes. That's basically it. We're policy here. We're democracy. And if we don't come together, like he said, and tell them, you want my vote, you have to do this for me. But we keep doing the same thing. And we keep putting the wrong people in positions. So, yeah, we need to come up with a plan. And that was my point. Yeah, thank you, thank yeah. you, thank you. Dr. Anis, what are you thinking? 
I'm thinking it's like a, uh, I'm George Annis, the Center for Health Law Bioethics. Look at me like I have an answer to something. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, we're in we're in a horrible situation in this country. Uh, what we've done in the past is yeah, what we've done in the past is take a look at it and have a moment of silence. We heard that before, and uh, I think that the people who said the moment of silence is over have to be right. It's got to be a time uh, to do something. I don't have, have an answer, I've heard some, some good suggestions here. But uh, obviously we're in a school and, and part of our, our, our duties is to, to teach the next generation. But as the next generation, we also have a duty to the rest of, of the country to try to move it in a much more peaceful, organized, respectful direction. And uh, you know, I, this, this kills me to hear stories of of uh, young black men having to kowtow to the police. I, I, I'm always a pain in the ass, but uh, uh, I know no matter what I say to police, I've had lots of confrontations with police because I'm not a great driver. <laughs> <laughs> the worst they'll do is call for backup, and they often do that, but they're not going to shoot me, and they're not even going to man him. I just know that. It's filth. You know, I don't even have to think about that. And that's just horrible. That's unacceptable. It's going to be unacceptable to have our police department, and they are our police department, as, as you know, we'll put it. Uh, treat people differently based on the color of their skin. We just have to say that and we have to figure out how to stop it. Thank you. Hi, uh, Sheila Chapman in the section of general internal medicine at our office of faculty. <laughs> <laughs> you my boss. <laughs> So I just wanted to share a little bit of my own personal journey these last few days. And first, I, I had to take time to just grieve, period. When I came in Friday morning, you know, people say, hey, how you doing? You say, fine. I said, I'm sad. And, you know, just so struck by none of the deaths had to happen. None of them. Folks in the car didn't need to happen. The police officers in Dallas didn't need to happen. And then I really went back to my spiritual practice. I'm a practicing Buddhist. And I thought about a number of different things. And one of the things that we're taught is about killing the will to kill. So in many ways, it's easy to kind of look at this issue only from the perspective of the police not being trained appropriately or whatever. But I think it's more challenging for us to look into our own lives and see where the violence to others is in our own lives. When we don't have empathy for another, and there are many ways that can be manifested. I think another key thing I started thinking about was the history in this country. So if we look at Jim Crow law, police were part of maintaining Jim Crow status. So this, this history of quote unquote perceived distrust that black people have, it's based in reality. It's based in historical fact. And I think we're at a moment where we have an opportunity to really push this issue of dialogue. And that's why we're so happy we were meeting today. Because I think dialogue is very important in terms of educating each other about <clears throat> real realities, about developing empathy for one another. And it is much harder to harm someone that you've gotten to know. Um, and, and, and then I wanted to push us a little bit further and say, yes, this is about the recent killings and it's about police, but what are we doing here on our medical campus? Why are our medical students, when they come out of school, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, right? Because I just had you in my office, right? And then somehow by the time they finish residency, they're jaded. All of those addicts never believe what they say. They always lie about how much they use. Well, if those addicts are black, then is that how now you leave our residency programs feeling that that's how all black people are? So I think we also are challenged to look at ourselves, to work with each other about not continuing stereotypes within our own campus. I need y'all 
officers, don't be shy. This is your opportunity. I'm Carol Mostow. I'm a social worker who works with residents and family medicine. Um, it was when I was a social worker at an mental health clinic, like over 30 years ago, there was a 14-year-old boy who was late to therapy, African-American boy from the housing project behind the clinic, who was late because it was the fifth time he was stopped by the police. And that, maybe 35 years ago, was a wake-up call to me. I knew he wanted as a Jehovah's Witness. They were sure he had drugs, but it was his, actually his homework, as he turned out his pockets. And I was outraged. It was like my little introduction to the fact of two Americas. Uh, and went to a friend who taught street law, and she said, are you kidding me? You can't tell him he should be protecting his rights. Do you want some, him to be beaten up? And I started understanding that he lived in a different America than I did, and uh, we were gonna be treated differently. Um, and it was when I came here, Boston Medical Center, and started working with burnt out residents who were treating Boston City Hospital patients and had no idea about their backgrounds that the lessons of that boy, you know, he taught me something that I've continued to bring to work. And so the question about what can we do, I think bearing witness to our patients, who they are, and figuring out, someone mentioned even like whether there's a reporting mechanism, but you know, is there some place to bring things? So you obviously, the patient's at the point where they're stopped and they're against the car. That may not be the moment when they have many options, but whether there is a civic, movement somehow. I mean, there, there's bearing witness in numbers of ways. I think there's bearing witness directly when patients come and you hear that. How do you respond to that patient? How do you validate and let someone know that should not happen to you? That is not right. You didn't deserve that. How do we validate our patients? How do we keep our empathy alive that many things are going on for our patients and not start blaming them for the problems that they're struggling with? All those things I think we can do. Politically, I think, we can avoid naming names, but I think we have to stand for love and caring in our country rather than hate. There's no question about that, and that's certain within the helping traditions. If we stand for health, we stand for the fact that hate cannot be our political platforms. Thank you so much. Um, I'm Peggy James, I'm uh, uh, Vice President of Mission and Associate Chief Medical Officer. We'll, we'll leave Michael to your mouth. Uh, okay. Yeah. And, um, Admittedly, it's a little hard. It's hard to talk about it. Especially when, you know, it's in mass like this. Well, I'm sorry I didn't think this would happen. I had no idea, to tell you the truth. But uh, what I have been thinking about, even like before today, when, um, when I knew this was going to, you know, we were going to have this gathering, is I kept being worried about the students and the residents, and I kept feeling like they needed some sort of like comfort. I didn't think that we would actually come in this room and come up with actual solutions. Although I don't go to church, I'm sorry, guys, but I, <laughs> I feel like it's like church for people. Sometimes it's like what people need to just be able to get this out and to be able to say things, to talk about it, to express it, to have their feelings and their fears acknowledged. And I think part of where anger comes, not only from the things you see, but people pushing you back, you know, when you try to make a point about something. And on both sides, I mean, just to like hear, just hear people out. Because everybody is, you know, interpreting what they what they see and what they hear through their own life experiences and just to like respect that and acknowledge that. And so for the students and the residents, I know you see it. I know you see it when you're working. I know you see it clinically. I know you guys see it. Over the years you come to me with certain different things. Um, and I agree with Sheila. I think the best way that you can empower yourself and to change things <laughs> is to set an example and teach others. And don't be shy about it. Don't just let it be you and you. I know you walk in a room sometime and a patient of color will say, you're the doctor? I know you experienced that. I mean, you tell me you experienced it. I've experienced it myself. Um, but to set an example and help your other colleagues to like not uh, stigmatize people. You know, not stigmatize people. Because Allison, you might want to hear this. It does affect the bottom line. Really, because it's, it's those kind of things that keep people returning in the hospital 
because we um, misinterpret things or uh, things or assume things about them, and they wind up, um, you know, leaving without something with the with a discharge thing that won't get the intended outcome, you know, that you had. Um, <coughs> I just feel I just feel like we each have an opportunity to actually do something and to show each other and to set an example for each other and to empower your patients, you know, at the same time. To just, um, you know, give them an opportunity to to feel good about themselves and to be able to thrive. And you yourself will feel better as well. Don't be afraid to, you know, speak up. I remember when I was in medical school, um, uh, all I kept thinking was one day I'll get on the other side of this and then I'll have a chance to support other people and empower other people. Um, and so uh, you have the same opportunity, and everybody in this room has that opportunity. You know, please don't be afraid, you know, to just like, to speak up and to set an example for other people. And just try not to um, make assumptions. Whoever said that once you get on the wards, you become a different person, it can get, get sort of get beaten out of you. Um, you know, try not to let that happen. People come here and say they work here for the mission. Lots of people come here and say they work here for the mission, but I'm not in certain. I'm not certain they have a critical analysis of what that actually is. When you wind up here in whatever your predicament is, how did that happen and why does that happen? What are the structural things that contribute to you being in that position in your life? So it's not like charity work. It's not like a soup line. It's not like something like that. It's like Having a critical eye and an understanding of why people are like they are, that way you can target an intervention that will break the cycle and change the course. And that's it, I'm sorry. No, thank you, David. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you know, this, this reminds me of um, uh, that, I think it's right, that we actually there's multiple levels to this, and one level is we have to take care of this community, ourselves, our trainees, our colleagues, because you know, I've worked in many post-conflict countries, and and because the, the media, the access that we have to these images, it's, it's exposing everyone to these horrible things. And so, I can, you know, I'm reminded of like, you know, this very well, could be kind of seen as kind of a, not a post-traumatic sort of situation, but stress, chronic type stress. And you can imagine that you know, if we're not talking about it, then we're not addressing it. And, and, and I'm most concerned that it will have a medical impact. So this alone, this issue, will shorten lives, not by guns, but by heart attacks. The, the impact of the stress related to worrying about every time you pass a police officer, your blood pressure takes off, cortisol shoots up, all of this stuff, and you have and you live this every day. And every time you see something on TV, it triggers the same response, right? And that's that shortens lives. That that leads to cardiovascular disease, and we've seen it in post-conflict countries, um, and so. It's important to think about what we can do here to prevent this for this medical community while we're thinking about how we help our patients and also prevent this, and then we think about the broader picture. But we, I now have a, even a different sense of urgency about we gotta, we gotta face this head on and to, to let, to develop solutions internally to take care of ourselves because everybody's talking about a patient bringing up, it to, you know, it, and then you just can't avoid it in the media. Every time that thing flashes in the media, there it goes again. It triggers sadness, it triggers whatever, but that's a physiological thing that we know from post-conflict countries that, that shortens lives. And so it's a different type of urgency, it's a different type of concern, but it's real. It's real. And, uh, and I'm reminded of um, data from years ago that showed that, for instance, African American physicians die younger. They die younger. Just they just die younger. Cardiovascular disease, you know, the typical stress-related diseases, right? And you imagine their experiences in the medical system is quite different. 
and in life, quite different. They die younger. So we, there's another urgency. Yeah, I, I wonder, David, to what extent this also impacts the performance of our own students. Uh, I, can't, I can't begin to imagine. The New York Times had an article over the weekend about uh, how women perform much more poorly than men playing chess. Out of the 100 top players in the world, there's not a single woman. However, when women compete uh, and they do not know the gender of the individual, they actually compete equally. And they have the, so I wonder, I wonder how many, all, uh, how all these uh, biases impact the very performance. Anna, say something, please, about that. You, what are you, fourth year now? All right, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Adam Johnson. I'm a fourth year medical school student. I'm fine, sorry, here. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> no, not all the things I'm going to But one of the things I really want to talk about, um, we talked about the police shootings, and just kind of piggybacking what was talking about what Dr. Kaplan had to say. Like, this isn't an issue of just uh, stopping police violence. This is an issue that was, you know, how the country was started on violence, on uh, segregating people on putting a certain group of people down. But one of the things that we can do, not even on a political point, I really would like to speak on as a student what we should do or what some of the things that should be done here as an institution. I hope I don't get in trouble. <laughs> but just from my personal experience being here at BU, there have been times where even some of the professors here are like, you dress well for one of them. like. Or where you have a colleague who was in, who came up through the same program, the EMSSP program, which I really appreciate. She did well. This person didn't do well in a particular class. They go to a professor asking for help, and the professor says to them, "Well, the reason why you're not doing well is because you came through that program." So we're on top of me, or on top of us, already thinking about police brutality and me trying to get through these already difficult classes, I have to already, I have to mentally battle professors who don't even believe I should already be here. So if we could do anything to stop police brutality or stop any of this, I think we should really concentrate at BU and having these conversations with not just students, with the professors. We should have these conversations with more deans, more administrators, because when you feel powerless, I can talk to you and cry to my friend at the same time, but that's not going to change anything. Like We have to have these conversations with more deans, more administrators, in the midst of uh, underrepresented minorities or in the midst of other people like you all who care. And it's funny, because not that it's funny, but the people who usually come to these things are never the problem. <laughs> like, you guys are the ones that care. So that's my spiel, and thank you all for being here. Hi, my name is Maya. I'm a family medicine resident. Um, and I have a sort of more political question to throw out and then a personal thought. So the political one is, we all know that if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So if you train police for combat and you arm them for combat, then everything looks like combat. And so part of what we need to do is train, and I don't know how we do this, but train for mediation, train for not confrontation, but for solutions and for um, compromise. Um, and then on a personal level, as a physician, I feel empowered to support my patients. But as a parent of an Afro-Latino son who says to me, why isn't this fair? Why can't I act like everybody else? How come when a police pulls me over, and he's still a baby, but you know, I know the question comes, and I have to say, when you get pulled over, you put your hands in front, you don't reach for your registration, you don't touch anything, because it's not safe, and it's not a safe world. And that makes me very angry and very sad. Um, and I just want to thank you guys for having this forum because this is empowering to know that there are other people that care about this issue. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to add a, a comment. I'm Jason Shear. I'm a, a new internal medicine resident uh, intern. <laughs> I snuck away from the floors. <laughs> <laughs> And so I also went to medical school here, so I have a perspective of, of a student and now as an employee of the hospital. Um, and it was a tough decision to actually stay here for residency, because some of the same experiences Adam was talking about I experienced while I was here. 
And so to make the decision to go back to a place where you didn't particularly feel well supported to further your training, it was a little backwards. Um, but I had a couple of experiences uh, during my fourth year. Uh, one time I had a patient, it was an elderly black lady, and she called me her boyfriend. <laughs> and so actually Dr. Benjamin was my attending. Um, and everybody thought it was funny, like, ha ha, you know, you're her boyfriend, ha ha. And Dr. Benjamin said something. She said, it's funny, she's probably never had an African-American physician her entire life, and she's 89 years old. That must be powerful to her, and she connects to you, and she just calls you her boyfriend, because it's familiar to her. Um, and I also had an experience today, uh, which, which was actually very touching and moving, especially with the events that happened last week, or this, this past week. Um, going into a lady's room, she's a little demented, uh, but a very pleasant lady, and I say, hi, I'm Dr. Shear. She said, you're my doctor? And I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm your doctor for the day. And after the team was leaving, uh, she said, you know, you're young, gifted, and black, and I'm very happy that you're my doctor. And like, it was, that was moving. Everybody thought it was like, you know, funny and cute, but going through, kind of living in both worlds. So when I leave the hospital, in the hospital, I'm a physician. When I leave the hospital, I'm a 6'2", 220 black male that's threatening to a lot of people. Uh, the second I step off the campus, they don't know if I'm a patient, if I'm a drug addict, or if I'm a physician. So I constantly struggle with how do I act around uh, my colleagues? How do I act when I'm out in the world? Um, so coming to a forum like this, uh, it's very lift, uplifting for me to know that there's a lot of people here that care about me, that support me, and that want me to do well. Uh, it's not only as a physician, but as a black male in the world. Um, so I'm happy to be here. I'm happy this happened. I just wanted to share those experiences because uh, it kind of, the experience today made me realize I made the right decision in coming to Boston Medical Center. <laughs> I too am a brand new intern. I've had 15, 15 days on the board. Also, <laughs> also went to medical school here and came through the early medical school selection program. Um, and I've experienced a lot of things that my colleagues have spoken about. And I think particularly EMSSP has a, a special a special journey through BUSM where we come from HBCUs and primarily Hispanic serving like, um, institutions. So a lot of our family is in the South. So when these events happen, we can talk to each other and we can speak with our family, but I, I don't think you realize how difficult sometimes it is to open your phone during lunch and see that three people have been killed by gun violence. And you kind of just have to put that in your pocket and maybe deal with it when you get home. And one thing I didn't expect when I transitioned from student to resident is having to work with my patients and try to dispel some of the distrust that they've had in the medical system. Um, so many people have Thought, they, thought that they were lying or, you know, they never gotten the treatment that they needed. And it's almost impossible for me to dispel that and make them think that I've given them the treatment that they need in this short amount of time. I also have a special place for the medical school. Like Adam, I, I understand where he's coming from, but now that I'm not in the school, I think it's important to take the opportunities that I have to make sure that these issues are you know, as clear as they can be. A lot of these issues are happening as medical students, and a lot of times we didn't feel empowered to say things or do things because, you know, our goal is still to become doctors, and we have to make sure that we can coexist with our colleagues and not make it awkward every day that we have to come to work. So we often deal with these things every day, and we just shut them down, whether it's from professors, whether it's from classmates, whether it's from patients. And that is always difficult, very difficult to deal with. So I was so very excited that this happened today, and I hope that we continue to have these types of forums, because we can talk about it amongst ourselves as much as we, as much as until we're blue in the face. But having forums like this so that people know that these are feelings that we have and there are plenty of faces, I recognize a whole section of people who I know will unfortunately experience the same things. They need these forums to be able to come and say that they're having these feelings and for you guys to know that this is something we deal with every day. So if I seem down in the morning, no, it's not because I'm tired, it's because all of these things have happened overnight and I can't talk about it at work, I can't talk to my colleagues. So I think it's important to just sometimes take a step back and unpack with everyone and make sure that they're able to express these things. Thank you so much. I'm Dr. 
Dr. Willock uh, was the chief of anesthesia here and left uh, in 2002 to go to California. Um, this is, it's important to talk about these things, but I, I want to give you a little bit of history. As you can see, I'm old. When I was an intern in those days, I looked at the statistics. I was the 19th woman of color to graduate from medical school. So put in perspective of what the president said, we have come a long way, but we still have a long way to go. And as bad as things may be now, I don't want you all to leave here uh, unhappy, depressed, and hopeless. Because we, like life, it's a continuing improvement that we all have to work on. I think Boston Medical Center has made great strides. When I came here, I was the first woman chief, the second black. And I had a faculty member tell me I would never work for a black woman. And I had no one to tell that to. So we've come a long way. The fact that the administration has welcomed and sanctioned this shows progress. I think Boston Medical Center has a lot more to do for this community. It has done medical care, but as far as the greater area, I think so. Commissioner Evans has done a great job with the police, but more, I think Boston Medical Center has the opportunity to be the leader in this community on this, on this subject. And just about police violence, and I think as much as, because many of us here are black, I was stopped as a medical student in my new car <laughs> years ago. Uh, my brother was stopped and checked. He was an engineer with the new Mercedes, so he was stopped. Uh, but police violence, when I was an intern at Kings County, okay, as I said, there were only 6% women and very few blacks. I think there were two blacks in there. The police would beat up disruptive people. Because the guy would come back in the emergency, hey doc, you gotta sew me up. You know, I got beat up. And these were not all black men, they were white men. I think there was an abuse of police power. And I think they are beginning to understand that they need better training. Uh, just like you have abusive chiefs of anything, chiefs of service, chiefs of departments, head nurses, principals, I think the same thing has happened to where they don't understand the power is a responsibility, it's not to be abused. But things are better, and this violence against white, as many as the black men have been killed, many more white men have been killed. And I think as we talk so much about the black and the, the violence against blacks and Latinos, and we ignore the other people who are suffering, that creates somewhat of what Trump appeals to, the working class white who feels marginalized. So the basic thing is that we should marginalize no one, no one, not our patients, not our neighbors. And for the black people, how many of you have a true white friend, an Asian friend, an Indian friend? Everybody, a white friend, a black friend. How do you speak to your neighbors? One of my neighbors said to me this weekend, I live in a, in a, a building that's 90% white. She said to me, well, are they doing anything about the, the black and black violence? And she said that right to my face. So I'm having a conversation with her. <laughs> she may not want a conversation with me, but I will have a conversation with her. But many of my other neighbors have been very sympathetic and understanding. And actually, our book club is going to read Tehisi Coates' book. Okay. And that was suggested by one of the white women, not by me. So I think there are a lot of people who understand and who want to make positive change. So I think we need to take a positive attitude, do what we can. Don't feel hopeless, because when you feel hopeless, then you get fear and you're not positive. Thank you. My name is Sandra Gordon in internal medicine. I'm on the physician's faculty here. 
Um, two things have really come to mind um, earlier when people are speaking. I feel particularly for all of the students of color here, um, particularly the young black men, as I have a young black son too, and like that other lady said, it's very hard, both as a mother, where you have to warn your child about what could happen. He's 21, six foot one, six foot two, 260 pounds, totally very threatening and intimidating. And, but I also understand, I have friends who are also on the police force, and I understand the pain that they're also experiencing at this time. So I think we can have both levels. I think Obama said it yesterday. You can feel in your heart for both. I feel for my police colleagues. I also feel for my young people of color. I, I, I really, I think part of this is we have to have more understanding with each other. I think particularly what that other, you know, the doctor said just now, if you're having other people of other nationalities where you could have this discussion, I say to my colleagues in my section, I say, gosh, did you have that conversation with your patient this morning? Almost every patient will come in to me and say, Dr. Gordon, how's your son? How are you doing with this? I said to you know, Warren Hirsch, he's Jewish, Mitch. I said, Mitch, do you have these conversations with your patients? Are they asking you what happened at the synagogue? You know, it's not happening. And so, you know, in terms of just being delayed every day dealing with this, but we have to address it because our patients are feeling this. They're feeling the trauma, they're feeling the pain. They know me as a mother, a mother of a young black man, what I'm fearing. I fear just as much whether I live in Roxbury or Milton. It doesn't matter. I feel it, my son fears it. But I think also, two things I also want to say. I think going forward, I talk to the residents about this. I'm not shy about talking about this. I bring it up because they say, Dr. Gordon, you've been stuck? Yes, when I go into Jordan's or Macy's, like as that young man said, if I don't have on a white coat, which I don't, I get followed around the store. I'm not a black man, but I get followed around the store. I've had to address this with people. Why are you following me? They think I'm gonna steal your $5 or $10 lipstick. I get followed everywhere. Do you know what I'm saying? It's because one, before I even changed the hair, when I had more of a dreadlock look, I had more people stop me. It's, it's there, we have to face this. And I think it's painful, and for our majority colleagues to understand, it's not that there's this, not, 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 there, there is an anger, there is a frustration, because we face this every day. I can take off my white, in the hospital, my white coat's on, 24 years here, almost everybody knows me. Once I leave the hospital, huh? Then the blood pressure goes up. Then, you know, you worry about things. So I think we are in a time where we have to talk about this. It's real, and I particularly feel for the residents and the students, because I can face this now, because I can say, hey, this is not appropriate. Um, you can't stop me. You can't follow me around the store. Um, I, I'm very careful, of course. I don't say anything like that to the police, and I warn my son not to do that. But I can sort of stand up for myself. I think as a woman, it's still a little bit different. But I just want to say that we really do have to have these conversations. I do feel we're preaching to the choir. Um, those of us are here are very sensitive to these issues. I think just going out, going forward, this really needs to be addressed to the chairs, the professors, because what these students are feeling, it's very real. They've come to me, they've told me these feelings, and it's not, it's not a few. It's a lot, and, and I just hope going forward that we can, um, I am hopeful. I do think things will change, um, but I'm also sober about the fact it may take a very long time um, because of the climate that we're in right now. Thank you so much, because I want to be, we want to be respectful of your time, so we're gonna let, uh, uh, Kate Walsh, the president of Boston Medical Center, have the last word, and then I have a little treat for you. Kate, please. Well, I shouldn't have the last word, no, because well. I'm not sure there, but I have, I had sort of one comment and one question. Um, the comment is to, as we think about how we support our community, to not only think about the people in this room, but there are 6,000 people who wear BMC ID badge. More than half of them are people of color, and they have fewer resources to lean on at times like this than medical students, residents, and faculty do. So I, I want to be sure that we think about um, the people who can't be here tonight because they finished their housekeeping shift and went to their second job. And that's kind of what I worry about because I think the stress that we're talking about is, is as real for them, if not more, and there are fewer resources. And the people who, who this, these injustices are happening to, it's their neighbors, it's their friends. And so that's the first comment. The second is a question. 
And thinking about what we could do as an organization, I, it was your comment, I don't need to point, because I don't know your name, hi, I'm Kate. But you know, we, we ask our patients like really personal questions. We ask them sexual partners, and we ask them to give them food. And we ask them, why, why couldn't we, in a manner of trauma-informed care, ask the question, have you felt threatened because of? And track it, and there's lots of like whiz kids here, and do some research and get the information out there and maybe even collect biomarkers and actually be the medical campus that, that names this, shapes it, talks about it, and figures out how to cure it. That sounds like a question. <laughs> <laughs> He just came over and asked me for money for that. It was my idea. You should fund me. All right, don't, don't worry, kid. You're not going to have the last word because uh, some things cannot be stated with words. And that's why I've asked uh, Lance Martin from uh, the Office of Diversity and Multicultural Affairs to uh, bring his meeting to a closure and to help us uh, ponder uh, the situation that we are in this country today. Lance, please. church now, so you don't have to be, I said, we're in church now, so you don't have to be quiet, okay. <laughs> Thank you.